Thank you. Welcome to Senate Education, yeah. Thursday, April 7th, 205. A uh, couple of housekeeping items, or, or maybe one. Uh, the House Education Committee did vote out uh, a universal meals bill today, a pilot program they're calling it for one year using 29 million of the education surplus uh, funds. Um, something for us to discuss at some point. I know that I have a real concern <laughs> in this committee. They didn't put any money in for PCBs. Uh, I, I, I do am worried about $29 million going to a pilot program for one year uh, for, for expansion of meals. But um, we mm. will have that discussion. Uh, I think part of my concern is you know, it's you've got a lot of uh, middle and upper middle class Vermonters, as we talked about in this committee, that would certainly benefit from that. And we haven't, you know, funded reach up at, you know, honestly, over the past several years, we haven't. And I'm not sure it's where I would put my first dollar. So that's just where I'm at. I missed the preamble to this. Yeah. You said they put it in a bill or passed it? You know, they put it amendment. in. They put it in the uh, S100 bill. Is, is my understanding from the chair. So now this will go to House uh, Ways and Means, the uh, Universal Meals. Oh, the, oh, from, last from last year. From last year. So okay. sorry yeah, yeah. about that not being clear. So they expanded it to lunch. And uh, yeah, I mean, I'll be honest, uh, and I've been upfront with the advocates in the hall, these are choices. And to me, the choice of 29 million disappearing for one, after one year. I'm more inclined, just speaking for myself, to do something where we've got PCBs and school construction and all those kinds of things that are more long-term. Uh, and long -term. permanent. And permanent, yes. I, I, mm. I really genuinely worry about it. Yes, Senator Jim. For what it's worth, I'm on the same line. Yeah, uh, yeah, and, and you know, we'll jump into it. And maybe there'll be ways to find, to, to, to deal with all of these issues, but um, so I, I it's a concern. Yeah. You need to know what that pilot entails. Is that for the whole state? Um, you know, I mean, I would think at it's for the nine state. million, it would yeah. be for the whole it's state. For the state. Is there a way of doing something on a much smaller scale? Just Rutland County. Just Rutland County. That's right. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. So there's that, uh, this bit of housekeeping just to keep everyone aware of where things are and it'll be How is that going to land in terms of decision making? Because obviously we're going to want to have the PCB stuff in there. Right. So is it going to, uh, are these two bills going to collide or are they going to end up together in appropriations where the decision will be made? So I, or so I, priority? Mm -hmm. so what I uh, conveyed to the chair uh, of appropriations, and I believe I'm representing everyone in this, or was accurately representing the committee's issue, is that we are, would like PCBs to be addressed. Um, and I think she will look to us, though, to help navigate whether or not, and I, and I think it'll be a combination of this committee, appropriations, and ways and means. Uh, I talked to Senator Cummings this morning as well about this. And, you know, again, I don't want, I, I don't know where the whole Senate will end, but um, I think there, there, are, there are some, I think generally there are some concerns about a one year pilot, 29 million would be gone, and uh, we might not address other issues. So, mm -hmm. anyhow. But, and we've had, we have a request from our committee for a significant uh, appropriation for the food shelf. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And they are, so there's a lot of the food bank. Mm -hmm. Food bank. That's what I meant. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Yeah, maybe it's not. So for today, though, we're going to continue our work on S27. We're going to uh, follow up with Colin Robinson uh, from the NEA who. He and Ms. Longchamp, you may recall, gave us the outline of the future workforce shortage idea, how to address it. Well, there were some questions around funding. I'd like him just to talk to us about the flow of funding that you raised and, and others. Um, back to 727, then we have UM, UVM coming in on S104, <clears throat> uh, an act relating to education, military families, which is now part of H517. 
And then SQ48, I have a memo here that I think many of you have seen online, but if not, uh, here is a paper copy of it. If you don't have a copy that I asked the state colleges and UVM to come in to talk about. And then finally, as I mentioned yesterday, we have uh, Peter T. Jout and Harrison Stark coming in for uh, here their position on SQ19. So all interesting stuff, perhaps starting with the most interesting, Ms. St. James, <laughs> H727. Thank you. Uh, Beth St. James, Office of Legislative Council. I think we finished chunk one and chunk two yesterday. That's true. Okay. Oh. So we're looking at the last chunk, which is chunk three. Yes, and Daphne, do you have a chunk three or did you already pass that up? We're looking at section four. Yes, yeah, session law. Yep. Mm -hmm. Pages one to twenty-three. Correct. That's all chunk three. Everyone have it? Mm -hmm. All right. Everybody good? Okay. Please. So chunk three is uh, four sections. So remember, we started with uh, redesignate a, a section devoted to redesignating two statutes, um, taking them out of chapter eleven and bumping them up to chapter nine. And then section two of this bill repealed chapter 11 and then section three was chunk one and chunk two together. So section four, five, six, and seven, uh, are, uh, they comprise chunk three and they are session law meant to address withdrawal, withdrawal processes that are already underway. So they'll straddle somehow old law and new law should this pass. So the first <laughs> section uh, is section four, and that is withdrawal actions approved by the state board, new districts with an operational date on or after July 1, 2023. So this section only applies to a withdrawal action initiated pursuant to uh, provisions of 16 DSA section 724 that were in effect prior to uh, the effective date of section three, so current law. And this draft will call it former section 724. And if each of the following actions occurred prior to the effective date of section three, which is remember chunk one and chunk two. Everyone on board? Okay. So, Here's the posture of this application. The State Board of Education has given final approval to the voter approved and the voter ratified proposal to withdraw from the Union School District. The State Board has declared a new school district to be reconstituted. The State Board established the new school district's operational date as July 1, 2023 or after. The voters of the new school district elected school board members. The voters of the towns within the union district voted to approve the financial terms of withdrawal negotiated by the boards of the new school district and union district. And the state board charged the new school district and its board with performing the transitional activities necessary to assume sole responsibility for the education of resident students on the identified operational date. So this, um, that basically describes uh, the Rixton situation. So the session law was meant to address Rixton. That they've gone through this process and there were other terms that were in the process but at various stages so they had to have gone through all of these yeah so section five will address uh the Joe situation section six will address the lincoln situation and then there's a little catch-all a generic catch-all at the end of section seven um so for section four what this section would apply only to uh, a withdrawal action that had already been approved. So the voters have already voted on it and the state board has already approved that withdrawal under current law. Did you say section seven? Yes, there's a section seven. It's, on, it's very short, it's on page 22. Oh, okay. So, uh, so Ripton is partly through their process, basically. I think they are already all the way through their process. Okay. And these guys. 
Yeah, section four. Se section, right, section four, four which is so these are for generally anybody who's all their way all the way through their process. Anyone who meets this exact criteria. Yeah. I, I think you will hear testimony from various stakeholders on who meets this criteria. Mm -hmm. um, Ripton was the town that was commonly referred to previously, but technically this this, this section would apply to any anyone who meets this criteria. I think there's probably only one town out there that does. Okay, I apologize uh, because I, I do admit I was looking for a moment at the other part of the bill, and this is allowing Ripton to do what? It is allowing so it is allowing Ripton to you'll see eventually. It has to give the state board an update on how it's doing okay. in um, preparing to meet its operational dates. This is just an overview of what section four is. Requires uh, the town, I don't want to say Ripton, sure. it requires the town, um, the new school district, mm -hmm. to uh, give the state board an update on its plan to meet its operational date. Mm -hmm. And then the state board looks at that information. Um, and uh, on your speaker. Um, because Richard wants out. Well, we don't, the, I don't, or, or a town, a, want, a, a town in Addison County with an R <laughs> likely <laughs> might want out in here from, from what I've heard. So, the state board is gonna make a, a is gonna, so there's a status report required, and then the state board is gonna say, Great, it looks like you're doing great, keep on trucking. Okay. Or the state board can say, we have some concerns, here they are. Okay. The town, the new school district, mm -hmm. has two options. It can say, thank you for that opinion, we're going to go full steam ahead. Mm -hmm. Or prior to October 1 of the operational date, it could take the off ramp that section 4 creates. Okay. And you'll see the off ramp in section 5 and section 6. And the off ramp allows them to get out of the process. It allows them to ask the state board to essentially void the a withdrawal approval and keep them as part of the unified union. So, does this section then allow them to withdraw sort of in the law as it stands now? They've already done that, they've already withdrawn under current law. They remember, current law says there's a vote of the petitioning town. Then it goes to all the rest of the towns in the union district. Yeah. And if they all say yes, then it goes to the state board for approval. Okay. So, so that's all happened. Okay. So what the piece that we're waiting on is the state board's reaction. The state board has already approved. Okay. I, I, I think uh oh sorry, go ahead. No, I was gonna say so why is it here if they've already been through the process? You're gonna have to take testimony on that. I think um they're coming tomorrow. I think the um, it's an excellent question, and it will help put this draft in perspective. And I um, I may be misremembering, but I think there was a lot of testimony um, prior to this draft being viewed, this language being viewed um, in the house, so it, it may have made more contextual sense. Um, hope you will now have. The framework with which to, to interact with your witnesses mm -hmm. um, in this section. But yes, I know that sounds very confusing that this is addressing uh, a withdrawal that has already happened for all intents and purposes. Mm -hmm. the, the, under, under current state law, they're done. They, they're done, they're withdrawn. They have an operational date that they are theoretically working towards. Mm -hmm. um, this just gives them, there's nothing in, there's no take backs in current state law. There's no do overs. Mm -hmm. So this gives them um, an opportunity to say, we, we, we would like to continue to, to, to remain in the union department. Okay. Uh, interesting. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. So that, that was basically a discussion of section four. Um, so just real quickly on page two, the um, state board is, or the um, new school district is required to give a status update to the State Board of Education. I'll point out the date of um, July 2022 on page two. So the re status report is due to the State Board on or before their regular July 2022 State Board meeting. I don't know when in the month of July the State Board plans to meet. 
But if this app takes a fast on July 1, um, that's a quick turnaround. So it would just be either a date to change or something to contemplate in the effective section, effective date section. Um, uh, and the, the, the status report essentially has to tell the state board what they are doing, um, working towards their operational base. And then the state board reviews that and gives the new school district an opportunity to be heard. And it may, in its discretion, take testimony from others, including the rest of the union school district that they just withdrew from and AOE. And then just like in the um, section 724 that we looked at yesterday in chapter two, they're gonna issue uh, a preparedness recommendation or a determination. So the state board could determine that it's likely that the new school districts will be prepared on operational date, or on page three, it could determine that it's unlikely, um, or that there is a reasonable risk that the new districts will not be prepared. And then that um, that opinion needs to be posted I'm on page three, uh, line eleven, it needs to be posted on the new school districts website, and that needs to be the topic or the uh, contents of the state board. Uh, report or recommendations need to be uh, scheduled for a topic of public discussion in the new school district. Uh, and then prior to the operational date and after any public discussions, just like I said uh, just a minute ago, they can go full steam ahead working towards that operational date or prior to the October 1 before the operational date and I'll explain that date in a second. They can on its own motion, so the the board of the new school district can vote to warn a vote, or it could warn a vote its petition to do so by at least five percent of the voters in the new school district. And that vote is to see if the new school district is going to request that the State Board of Education um, undo the withdrawal action. The October 1 date is so that um, if there are, uh, if there, if the off ramp is taken, there is time to address uh, staff contracts before the new school year. If it looks like the new school district is not going to be a new school district anymore. The question decided, so the vote to whether or not to ask the State Board of Education to undo the withdrawal action is decided by Australian ballot. And then I'm on page four, um, lines four through 11 are just about certification of the vote. Um, and then if the new school district, I'm on line 12 on page four, if the new school district requests the State Board to take action, then the state board shall reverse and void earlier declarations approving withdrawal and reconstituting the new school district and the withdrawal action initiated pursuant to the uh, former section 724 is concluded and the union school district shall continue to be solely responsible for the education for students residing in the town that petitions for withdrawal. However, on the top of page five, the new school district and its board shall continue to exist for up to six months after the day on which the state board reverses and voids its earlier declaration to wrap up business. And then the state board may make any other declarations or actions necessary to support um, that with undoing action. Yes, lines. My, just a question: Has 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 this has withdrawal happened by any school yet under current statute? Yes, I believe there have been multiple, multiple all throughout yeah, the. Yeah. Would you say that's so, so this is based on the process that they use for that. No, it's an improvement. This is that. brand new, mm -hmm. and it's, it was the original language and concept, um, which was honed <laughs> through discussion and testimony by House Ed. The original proposal it came from the State Board of Education on how to address these districts that are currently either yeah. underway or in this particular section already mm -hmm. happened, but there might might be some changes perhaps. Do you, can you tell if the thrift didn't testify? Mm -hmm. Multiple people uh, in different. various different capacities. But I did not hear every um, witness. I was not there for all testimony. 
Or hope? No, I'm just, this also along with um, accommodating towns that are in the process gives a town that has already done this the opportunity to change their mind. Yes, it gives a, a new school district that is formed and meets all of the criteria on page one. Um, the opportunity to say, we uh, no longer want to withdraw, we want to remain a part of the union district. And that happens when 5% of the voters petition. Mm -hmm. The board. school or board the itself board. could decide to put it to a vote, mm -hmm. or they could be forced to put it to a vote by a petition of 5% of the voters. And then it's the voters of the new school district who decide whether or not to petition the school board to. Um, I guess you could look at it both ways, undo the withdrawal or remain in the union school district. It's the same, same consequences. I said the main thing of the section four is that it adds state board review mm -hmm. finding to the process, to the process yeah. that we wouldn't have now. So without the description, for example, would just be, be out. but this requires another review because the way the law was written, we didn't have that review from the board. They had to only make that one finding. They made. So I could see somebody from Richmond saying this is owners, not an improvement. But okay, they why do we have to do this? And they could, I mean, <clears throat> but they also could ignore that recommendation from the state board. It's, it's a process. Well, let's see. So I thought you had said that. <laughs> Page two. So the status report that's required of the new school district is a shall. Okay. So on or before the regular July 2022 FBE meeting, the new school district shall submit a written status report to the board. So the I understand. Uh, oh. I'm sorry, but whatever, they, they could ignore the state board. Yes, the off, the the, off right. ramp yeah. is, is totally okay. optional. They no, could, the, so if the board says, the preparedness deems unlikely. <laughs> they could say, well, thanks, but we're going at a. Correct. They so could ignore the, the board's warning that they're unlikely to be prepared. They have to um, hold uh, a meeting to allow public discussion of the, the board's recommendation. And then it's up to either the state board itself to decide to take the off ramp or if they are petitioned to do so warn a vote on whether or not to take the off-ramp or if they're petitioned to do so by five percent of voters to warn a vote on whether or not to take the off-ramp but if neither of those triggering events happen then they can just go full steam ahead with um preparing for their operational date so i come from a background with uh, city governance uh, municipal governance and land development regulations and we're always the caution with spot zoning and i feel like we were cautious at the beginning of this conversation to not necessarily name a specific town is, is that at all relevant here is there a concern that if Riffin isn't happy with what we're doing here but it seems like we are crafting language in order to address the Riffin scenario is that at all a factor in these discussions and in our intent that is intended solely in your wheelhouse i as Neutral legislative council um, didn't feel comfortable using the names of the towns constantly throughout. Um, I just wanted to, you haven't heard testimony from witnesses, so I wanted to put a little context around what you, the, the way in which this will probably be discussed and by which witnesses. Um, but uh, we don't need to delicately walk around the, the name. That's, of the a, that's for you to decide. Do we do it? We, I'm here in the energy world, and then we just say, like, we had legislation that was only for IBM, but we wouldn't say IBM. We'd say any you know chip manufacturer that has over 500 employees. Located <laughs> within the border. Right. <laughs> <laughs> <That's interesting. laughs> yeah. Like, I think the Rye Gate thing, they don't mention, Rye Gate, no. they mention any, you know, power, right. yeah. wood power plant that's over 500 kilowatts or something. We don't have to. Yeah, we don't have any caution as we're discussing this. We need to be more. No. We can do whatever we want. That's that's the so this is great. So my job here is to walk you through this language. Right? Yeah, there's no town names in any of these sections. Right. So my the only um, and maybe I just won't do it going forward. It was just you haven't heard. The, so when the state board gave this proposal, they obviously gave context from a policy standpoint right. that I'm unable to do, and you haven't had that yet. Right. So it was just to 
to attempt to set the stage, and it was perhaps a poor attempt. No. Um, but uh, this, none of nothing in uh, Chunk Three references a town by name. And theoretically, even if this legislation was drafted with one mm -hmm. town in mind, it applies to any town that fits this specific criteria. Practically speaking, there may be a limited amount of towns that do fit that criteria. And then the section four is set to repeal on July 1, 2023. So it's a limited, it's a limited amount of time um, to force that process to happen. Their, I believe their operational date is on July 1, 2023. Um, so well no, I just got a a, a letter from um of the, the representatives and senators from Memorial County that are talking about this mm -hmm. withdrawal section that we're looking at. So yeah, they're coming in tomorrow. They are? They okay. are. All right. Yeah, they are. And, okay, we're going to leave behind. Nope, nope. Can't miss it today. They are more likely to be interested in section five. Section five? Mm -hmm. Right, yeah. Okay. <clears throat> Please okay. continue. Okay. Any questions on section four? You want to keep going? Okay. Are we okay on time? It's 2 30. I know you had. Yeah, no, we are okay on time. Uh, actually, is Colin here? Colin is. All right. If you don't mind, then we'll break on this and we'll come back to it and uh, probably in about 20 minutes or so, 30 minutes. Is that okay with you? Okay. And Colin testifying on the on the road. teacher workforce. Yeah. So okay. if you want to stick around for that, that would be great. Thank you. Uh, you want to bring him in whenever you're ready to go. Thanks. Mr. Robinson, nice to see you. Good afternoon. Good to see you all. So thanks for coming back in on uh, the teacher workforce shortage. Uh, for those watching, and I'm not sure, Center Lines, if you were here when we actually jumped into this, uh, we're talking with our colleagues in appropriations about the possibility of doubling the proposal you put forward, which would bring us to maybe 300 teachers over the next couple, couple of years. Uh, to start to address this teacher shortage. And you've heard from this committee, our concern. We know that uh, there are other workforce development bills going, and this would likely end up in our miscellaneous education bill, or even more likely, perhaps directly in the budget. So uh, we're in conversation with Senate approach. That being said, we have some questions. And one of the questions uh, is, can you take us back and tell us a little bit about how this money flows? You and I had a conversation mm -hmm. in the hall, uh, and it really helped clarify things for me. <clears throat> then we talked about it a little bit in committee, and I thought best to have you in just to tell us again how, sort of how this would actually work. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. For the record, Con Robbins, Vermont NEA, and um, thanks again for the committee's focus on this. So, as it relates to the to the flow of um, money and the appropriation sort of outlined in here is um, as a practical matter, I think what would make sense is for it to actually be appropriated. Um, the money would eventually flow to the school districts. But of course, you know, because we're not talking about necessarily every single school district participating in this, or some school districts might have. 12 participants and some might have one, it can't be a direct um, allocation per district. And so the, the construct that we believe would be most appropriate would actually be for the um, funding to flow to the agency of education to then be um, paid directly to the school districts on a per participant level at the amount that we talked about on Tuesday, which is the 4750 figure. Um, and so for a district that had 12 participants in this program, they would get 12 times 4750. For a district that had um, three teachers, they'd have three times 4750. Um, I think that's the way it would programmatically and financially probably have make the most sense to, to flow to the districts. 
<laughs> Colin. So I partly raised this because of my personal experience with my spouse who uh, earned her master's degree paid for by a public school district in the great state of Vermont to the Southern New Hampshire University, oh, right. which was uh, marketing up in this area. Uh, and as she was taking that program, which she had a good experience with, I kept thinking, wouldn't those dollars be better kept in state since they are public dollars? Do you see any avenue for this, these monies that going through this agency of education to have some sort of restrictions so that they could only be used for uh, Vermont State College programs, VSC yeah. programs? Yep, that's a great question, Senator Chittenden. So as outlined in this proposal, um, and remember, just as a, a baseline for the committee and a reminder for those who might not have heard uh, previously, this is scaling up a program that is being stood up in the Northeast Kingdom right now. Right now. Mm -hmm. and, and so to that end, the specific arrangement um, and the credits that will be offered are through Castleton State University or Northern Vermont University uh, at Castleton. And so that is the institution of higher education that would be receiving the tuition dollars. Um, as outlined in this proposal, those dollars would, those tuition dollars would actually um, come through previously budgeted, allocated, uh, professional development dollars from the local district. So teachers at the local level, as I think you're sort of alluding to, Senator Chittenden, um, have access to professional development funds. In this case, those in this program, those professional development funds would be used to pay for the three credit course at Castleton or Northern Vermont University Castleton. Uh, I apologize for probably not speaking the the name of the university correctly today. <laughs> My apologies for missing that. I received a lot of memos this week. No problem. Senator Booker. Yes. Oh, and sorry, if, if, I, if you mind, Senator no, Booker, I just ask one quick question. Uh, and with the pilot program that we're sort of standing from the kingdom, do those dollars go to AOE now? The, I was talking with um, my colleague, uh, Juliet Longchamp, about that. Um, and, you know, if you remember the origin story on that was seven curriculum directors came to her and said, hey, we need help, right? Um, right. And, and, and um, so I believe they're braiding different funds, some ESSER funds, some um, other local funds available, but I also understand there are some districts in the kingdom that want to participate in this program, but don't have the resources to do it. And so, so what- question, is, there, is there any, is AO, AOE involved right now? We're putting AOE sort of in the center, you know, to distribute the funds, but right now they're not. Well, that that is correct. I mean, I see. Uh, I, 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 but what I will what I will say is that my colleague Julie has been in um, yeah. multiple conversations with the licensing division at the Agency of Education that sure. she works with okay. frequently and uh, probably daily. Okay, thank you for that, Senator Hooker. Um, just wondering. Yesterday, I think Senator Chitten did mention visa as a possibility. And it seems, I, I'm not sure whether AOE has the, the resources that they we're need going to, to ask staff. AOE yeah. as as and uh, just wondering if that's an alternative. Um, may I respond? Is that, uh, um, so Senator Hooker, I think um, the proposal that, we, that we're talking about here and now is um, structured the way it is because it's ready to go now. Um, and, you know, obviously back in February, we spoke with you all about possible role for VSAC in helping develop and grow the teaching profession and the teacher workforce. And I think that that would be a really, really great conversation to dig into. I think it, it relates to this specific proposal um, the as envisioned, the structure is already there for these funds to go to um, Castleton. Um, and VSAC could very easily have a role in the, in the future or for future initiatives. Mr. Fisher, would you identify yourself for the record? And um, then we're just curious about the AOE flow through. Uh, for the record, Ted Fisher from my Institute of Education. I'm our Director of Communications and Legislative Affairs. And I apologize for the, I'm at slightly of a disadvantage. I'm not familiar with the program or the proposal. I'm originally phoning a friend. So I was just wondering if you could bring me a little bit of speed on I, I, I think I've got some from context, but I just want to be clear. Well, sure, this is the Grow Your Own program <clears throat> uh, that the agents that uh, Mr. Robinson and his team at the NEA started in the kingdom to 
you improve the workforce around uh, teachers. And we know that we've already heard, I think from, was either Mr. Robinson or Ms. Longchamp, about, Dr. Longchamp, about a thousand openings already for the fall. We don't want to not address this. And this seems like a really, a program that's already happening. There's some success and we're told that you know, at an investment of about, I think it's $1.5 million, we could get about, we could go toward getting 300 teachers uh, ready from, from local schools, people that are already in the district, people already working maybe in education and such capacity. Yeah. They, they might need to finish a couple classes, they might need to, you know, they need to get their certification, et cetera. We're, we're still, this is a, a model that we're seeing more and more nationally. We heard from some of our state education agency colleagues in other states, so. Program. Um, so just to make sure I understand what you're considering, the idea is for I'm I'm sorry, Colin, but I'm not to speed on this, but um your your I'm sure my colleagues are, but um your the consideration is to give money for for higher education courses or things to help folks get towards that uh, degree and get towards licensure. Is that am I understanding? Well, it's a little bit trickier than that. I mean, not tricky, but it involves you know paying, identifying teachers at local districts, local mm -hmm. schools who would serve as mentors. There's a a process where you know people would help them get certified, etc. And mm -hmm. we're looking for the agency of education to sort of be the the pass through for some of this money. Uh, Mr. Robinson. Yeah, and just for clarification, Ted, so it's it's going through the peer, working to provide wraparound supports to guide teachers through the peer review process that your um, licensing division stands up. So so it's fundamentally and deeply integrated with the peer, it, it is uh, guiding and supporting teachers on provisional licenses or aspiring educators who are starting the year next year on a provisional license to successfully complete the peer review process that one has to go through in the licensing division. Absolutely. Okay, so I, I reached out to our director of education quality, Dr. Halliday. Great. To see where he stands on this. If I, you know, the awesome thing about the digital world is sometimes I get a response like right. video with you. I would suggest and, and request that we come in and, and talk to you about this. I Mr. Holiday is here tomorrow, uh, but it'd be, be great to get this resolved actually uh, today if possible. Okay. Yeah, great. Is there a reason that you are here? I mean, I don't mean that. No, 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 I, don't mean that in, no I appreciate you being here. You're welcome to stay as long as you'd like. That wasn't, but I'm looking at the agenda and nothing else is popping up. So it's great if you're just here. Well, no, and I don't mean that. Honestly, no, 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 you know, the great thing about YouTube is we can we can listen in, but I like to be in the room if I can. No, I appreciate so. it. I really do. And I didn't mean it in any way. No, no. I, 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 I really did. This, I used to sit here basically all the time in the, in the afternoon, but it's a new thing to be back. It is. Can I just ask, um, sure, Mr. Fisher, if you yeah. could <clears throat> clarify something that came up yesterday? You mentioned the thousand openings. Yeah. And yesterday, right. Senator Perchley asked oh, right. you know, how many openings are there mm -hmm. in a normal year. Great question. Sure. And that's a good question for, for Dr. Halliday okay. for tomorrow. Okay. Right. What we have seen is a pretty, we have seen an increase. We've, we, this is not a new problem. And it's, and it's depending on the, well, the part of the state and depending on the type of license, right? So the type of specialty. And actually, um, uh, the Ed Quality Division puts out a, um, a, a report every year to yeah. the federal government on what are the shortage areas. So that's by licensing mm -hmm. category. So middle school social studies mm -hmm. or oftentimes um uh, and actually Colin is probably more familiar with it than I but um but you know a lot of times like music and arts sometimes there's shortage areas yeah. and it depends on the even in Vermont as a small state it might depend on the region of the county just because it's not on the thing that we often said just because a particular specialty isn't on that list doesn't mean there isn't a shortage in a part of the state right so that's pre-COVID now we are seeing the Writers of attrition, folks not entering the profession, right? So anything that you see from pre-COVID, you can, I think at this point, pretty much safely assume it's going to be after data. But it's a good question. Patrick probably has a better handle on exactly what the trends are. And hey, Mr. Robinson, do you have a, an answer to that? Those numbers? Um, on on the, the number of jobs? Yeah, generally, is this number of a thousand, that opening, is, it, is that where we usually are? Or is this really high? Or? I think it's higher. 
Um, and anecdotally, it's higher. I will say, similar to Ted, nobody's sort of um, been following the data as closely as perhaps you know would have collectively been useful. Um, but anecdotally, it's higher, and it's also early. So as a, as this committee knows from other conversations, teachers usually get issued their contract sometime in April and then return it. So we will. If we're seeing these numbers in April before teachers have received or maybe haven't mm -hmm. returned their contracts for next year, we can anticipate greater openings. I think also, and, and you can ask Dr. Uh, Patrick Halliday about this tomorrow. By the way, he has, Juliet Longchamp has um, shared this proposal with him. He's seen it, Great. so he can, he can speak to it and, and his perspective on it. Um, but uh, I believe there's also been a significant uptick in provisional licenses over the past two years. And I think there's something like 800 or so folks on provisional teacher licenses right now um, compared to pre-pandemic numbers, which were significantly smaller. I, 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 he would be able to tell you very specifically what that was. Um, and those provisional licenses are for two years. And what's envisioned here is helping somebody who's on a provisional license essentially sort of matriculate to a highly skilled classroom educator with a full endorsement and a license so they can stay in the classroom and build a career. Great. I think it's, it's exciting, it really is. Mm -hmm. And I'll, I'll be eager to hear, uh, is, is it Dr. Holliday? Mm -hmm. Dr. Yeah. Holliday tomorrow uh, on this issue and see what we can do. Great, yeah, please, Ms. Robinson. I have, I have one more point of clarification. My uh, yeah. colleague, Ju Julie, is texting me. Um, and she wanted me to point out that um, going back to the, the per person cost, um, $1,200 of that would actually stay with the Agency of Education because as you can see in the breakdown of the budget, $1,200 is the cost of the peer review fee that goes to the Agency of Education for these folks to receive their, their license. And so as envisioned, that $1,200 would actually uh, stay with the licensing division earmarked for the 300 participants in this program. So they then don't have to, that, that's not a financial barrier to them completing this program. So I'm just wondering, um, I know that when uh, Dr. Longchamp presented the program last time, you indicated there might be a deeper dive or another document that we could look at that would give greater explanation. Do you have that? Yes, um, I shared it um, with the the committee, and I believe Daphne is um, posted on the website. It is it's it's a thirteen page document. So there's there's a timeline, a detailed timeline, some job descriptions. Um, I did on that document. I I will say you'll see an organizational chart. Um, I did want to flag for the committee underneath the uh, the sort of breakdown of the the costs. There's something that talks about application process and student teaching equivalent. And I clarified with Julie, that is the existing peer review process requirements as the Agency of Education has them right now. So that's not something that's um, unique to this specific program. Those are the baseline processes established for the, the peer review process that an educator would have to go through to complete it um, with the Agency of Education. That was just to so I wanted to provide that, that clarification. We have that in our email, but it's not on the web page yet. Okay, then you okay. have it in your email and it, I'm sure it will be on the website uh, website yeah. soon. Yeah. yeah. No rush. We'll have it in our email. Um, anything else for Mr. Robinson? Mr. Fisher, just a point. Mr. Fisher, please. Just a point of clarification. Yeah. So I'm, I'm giving um, Patrick some uh, yeah. some updates for so he's so he's a, hopefully be more service to you tomorrow. What is the what is the dollar figure you're looking at right now? The, the dollar amount? Yeah. So doing? it was a seven twenty seven hundred twenty seven thousand dollars, I think, that would help us get to about one hundred fifty teachers. We doubled it in our sort of informal conversations and said it'd be great to try to get 300 teachers uh, and therefore whatever that ended up being. 
and the um, we were able to update the the document to reflect that 300 figure. So in the document that Daphne uh, um, is going to post, it will reflect the 300 person conversation of the of the committee. I really appreciate it. Yeah, no, thank you very much. You're okay. So, okay. okay. Please. Thanks. Okay. Sunday. Okay. 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 It was a good day. Now. Great. It was, it was already posted for yesterday. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Robinson, anything else from you on this? I mean, we were just curious about the flow, and, and that's yeah. really helpful. No, I, I appreciate the committee's. Um, interest and fast work on this and definitely as it as it moves into other committees please um happy to work as closely as as you need to move that process along um and obviously as as i think was noted you know i think this is the beginning of uh of uh, a conversation around around this issue and happy that we're able to come to committee in time to see this potentially be useful um for the acute need here now it's great work we really appreciate it Ms. Robinson, if you don't mind, given that we have spoken with the chair of approves, if, if, if you would reach out to that committee and just make yourself available, uh, you know, they are planning to move everything fast and furious. Yeah. And uh, we can certainly, our ledge council is working on some language uh, that we'll have that we could put in the budget, but it'd be great if you would just make yourself available to them so that they know that you could come and talk to them about it. Absolutely. I, I have other things to connect with that chair about, so I will happily add this to the list. Thanks for your time. I appreciate it. Great. Thank you.